Hi, Linda. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Wasi? Great, great to see you again. Um, you. So, so today, uh, Rhonda, we are here to talk about uh, design thinking and its value to organizations. So, for our audience, I just want to introduce myself and yourself. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, this is uh, Wasim Rajput, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm here today with Rhonda Tahir uh, to talk about design thinking and its value to organizations. Uh, Randa is a culture designer, uh, innovation facilitator, a TEDx and keynote speaker with a playful sandbox. She designs creative problem solving sessions, uh, biomimic analogies, uh, design thinking uh, boot camps, edutainment games, and creativity tools. Uh, Randa helps mavericks and entrepreneurs transform their uh, work, starting with the uh, smallest shifts uh, that nurture and innovative culture in their organizations. So I'm really glad to have uh, uh, Rhonda today uh, with us. And uh, we, again, uh, our topic today, Rhonda, is to talk about design thinking, its value to organizations. I think as we had discussed, what we'll do is we'll focus on, uh, uh, you know, what is design thinking, its value to organizations. Uh, then we'll go into the, uh, you know, methodologies, uh, whether it's design thinking or design thinking like methodologies. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the cultural problems that organizations have had or, or face in adopting uh, this approach, uh, uh, you know, within their organizations. So with that, uh, you know, maybe we can start by you telling us, uh, you know, based on your experience, uh, um, what value have you seen in design thinking as a summary? And then, you know, we can go, we can go from there. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Wasim. Thank you for this lovely introduction and for having me. I really appreciate it. Right. And uh, you touched a topic that is very dear to my heart and value of, of, of whether it's design thinking or, or innovation methodology. Yeah. It's, base, it's basic needs, I believe, because it gives you a process of things that you need to know, not be very sure of, of what exactly is going to happen for you. But as long as you trust the process, as long as you know that there is a next step that you know what to do, it gives you more of a ground, like a control of what's happening in your, in your life, in your work, in your organization. And I believe it's an important skill for kids to learn even in schools. So in terms of value and what they're for, basically they demystify innovation. Mm -hmm. it, it's no longer something, you know, of, a, of an elite or, a, or a, a solo genius to say, okay, this is a creative person. Uh, he or she will figure it out. It's more of, you know, I know the steps mm -hmm. and I know things will work out if I take the steps. It's like a formula, you know, just like when you learn algebra at school or when you learn, you know, how to compose a good sentence. It's a formula. Once you learn it, you become really good at it and it takes you step by step. So, the value of it, it goes beyond just the individual, but also the team and the organization. And if they know where they're heading, uh, it makes them all more powerful. No, I, I fully agree. I think what you, you really hit the nail on the head when you said that it's something that, uh, uh, you know, it gives, it's, it's, a, it's really a problem solving approach, right? And, yeah. you know, initially when I came across this methodology, uh, people had said that this is, uh, you know, uh, some people refer to it as a methodology. And you know, me coming from an or from a, from the background of uh, you know implementing systems and so forth, where you know I've dealt with methodologies all, all my life. I personally don't agree that it's a methodology, but it is a it's a problem solving approach. And and, and the reason and the, the the difference that I see is that you know in a traditional methodology, uh, where they talk about uh, you know usually when the term methodology comes in, you think of steps, step one, step two, step three, milestones. And the problem that has been with that approach is that people are too focused on creating milestones for every single step. Yeah. Whereas in design thinking, we don't want to focus too much on the milestone, but I think one of the things that you mentioned is the, it's the process. Because if we focus on the right process where we are focusing on, the, uh, in, on defining the problem, understanding the problem, and, uh, and creating ideas, testing those ideas, I think that's, that's what really what the value of design thinking is. So yeah. uh, and, and I think this is this this uh, this part of design thinking, um, again, organizations and we'll talk about this later, that organizations that have adopted it will think of it only as a methodology of mm. some specific steps don't usually do well in, in, in bringing the change that they're looking for. Uh, but but if you if you buy the principles, if you understand the process and you focus on the value, then, as you said, then it's not just for organizations, it's for the individual, for the children, for everyone. 
because you know you, you're focusing on the ideas on the principles and that's, so i think that that was a that was that was a good point absolutely and i love your comparison and, and how you saw that you know methodology uh, translates in different ways so I agree with you on a number of things. So uh, yes, uh, in, in, in different ways of working, you're looking at it and once you reach that milestone, you move up, you, move, you know, what's the next step? And people and organizations who implement design uh, uh, thinking at a very shallow or like surface level, they think about it the same way. They say, okay, step one, we have to do this. Step two, we have to do that. And if you say, you know, you need to go back to step one and you know, we're already in step four, we cannot go back to step one. And that just completely destroys the whole idea that it is an iterative process. So I would switch the word from milestone, although I want to keep the idea of you are going towards milestones because you are making progress. Mm -hmm. But I would switch the word uh, milestone with insights. So once you get insight, you can decide then, do you go to the next level or do you need to go back a little bit because you know, there are things that you don't understand or things you want to get more feedback about, right? Uh, so it's both. I think it's both. It's like you're going towards a milestone, but also taking the insights of what you, uh, what you received out of this immersive experience of being in a design thinking mindset. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, I think this, this part that you mentioned that, you know, in the traditional methodologies, when you go from step one to step two, you can't really go back, right? And uh, and and it's and 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 that's you know I think what people don't need to realize is that it's a learning process. And you would use mm -hmm. the word insights, and the insights uh, sometimes you know you, some it's not a uh, that you go from step one to step two and you will get an insight. Sometimes you have to go back and forth to get the yes. insight that you need to learn, exactly. right? And and this is a very key thing in learning organizations where you know people need to understand that the insights come in sometimes by moving from space to space. I was, I was, I was reading about, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, Tim Brown, who's, the, who's, who's uh, credited uh, for this methodology uh, and who's also the founder of IDEO, uh, 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 the firm, that he talks about three spaces that as opposed to looking at this as a methodology, we need to look at moving from the inspiration uh, space to the ideation space, to the implementation space. And they're not steps. So you could be an inspiration where you're understanding the problem, you define, you take your time to understand the problem, you define the problem, and then you go to the ideation phase. And, and it is possible you may have to go back if there are doubts about that you may not have defined the problem correctly. Then you go to implementation where you do some prototyping, testing, and you feel something has not worked out, you go back to the ideation space and inspiration. And then as you go back and forth, collect insights, you learn in this process. Then you come up with something where the problem is defined, where you have the right ideas, you have, uh, you know, you have encouraged everyone to create, generate a lot of ideas, and you have prototyped your ideas and you've learned from it, right? So, 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 so I think that's, that's, what, that's what gives it really power. And uh, one point that I would like to uh, mention is that I think that because it's mentioned quite a bit in the context of uh, design thinking, although I think design thing can be so used for to solve any kinds of problems as you mentioned early on but it's uh, it's usually when we're talking about uh, cre uh, designing products designing services they're saying there's a, there has to be a lot of focus on the customer and you know so mm -hmm. you empathize with what the customer wants the needs and so forth and you keep that in perspective as in the first step or first space where you're trying to understand the problem and then you move you know from space to space Exactly. No, exactly. It's, it's the core of it is is uh, empathy and connecting with the either the customer or the user or or the person who's going to actually experience the experience that you are creating. So it's definitely one of its core core elements is that empathy is a starting point and you always go back and forth to it. So another core element or a principle is that you are in the process of iteration, you are in the process of prototyping and you're constantly seeking feedback. So it's not a decision that you made and you move on. You need to make this decision and go back and check did it actually serve the purpose or is it only in your head? Right, because exactly. that's some of the problem where we suddenly find out we thought we did something amazing and then it's not catching up. Why is it not? Because it did not serve the need of the people that we are trying to help. 
And the third, the third core element in, in becoming really uh, in, um, with a mindset of design thinking is that you need to create the time and space for the ideas. They don't just, you can't just like push people towards coming up with things or ideas or concepts and not giving them the time, the space, the information, the feedback, the funding that they need and expect them to do some amazing work, right? So this this space and time is something that most people don't notice that they that they lack, right. that they don't have any much. They're always constantly trying to finish up projects. Exactly. I think this this I think you mentioned so many nice principles here. So you talked about um, the empathy part. You, you know, again, I go go back to this methodology. People who come from a very hardcore a waterfall kind of methodologies, but their focus is only on the outcome. Here, you know, you yeah. just, for the past three, four minutes, you talked about so many principles that people have traditionally never talked about in methodologies. You talked about empathy, right? Where you need to focus on what does the customer want? And it's not something that you can simply collect if you if we go into design thinking, and we can, again, talk about this at the, at the end when we are discussing some tools, that we have to immerse ourselves in understanding what the customer wants, right? What, what their problems are. So this principle exactly. alone is so powerful, right? Because you're taking the time, understanding the root causes of what delights a customer, for example, if, if you are creating a product. If, you create, if you're solving another problem, then you have to look at the, your stakeholders for that problem, whoever. But the idea is that you have to immerse yourself and empathize with that stakeholder, right? Yes. Uh, so that's principle number one. Principle number two you, you touched upon is uh, you talked about prototyping. You know, once, you know, first is the idea generation, sorry. You know, you have to give them, you mentioned that you have to give them the time and space. You know, again, in traditional methodolo methodologies, we never talked about giving them space. You know, who ever talked about, you know, today, and for example, in a typical design thinking session, as I'm sure you know, that you have to make sure that you have, you give them the right space. People are empowered and inspired to, to express themselves, to come up with ideas. Um, yes. One of the things that, and that's another principle, you know, giving them space is something that you have never seen, you would never normally see in traditional methodologies. It's, again, it's, it's about deliverables, milestones only, not how you come up with things, right? Yeah. And, and, and again, the problem there was that they would tell you what the traditional methodology would tell you to, for example, at least the, the background I come from, you know, and, and for systems delivery and so on, that they would tell you, for example, to create a, a, a system design document. Right, mm -hmm. uh, and come up with ideas in, in, in that in that document. Let's let's say design ideas, but no one ever focused on the process to come up with ideas. If you don't give them the space, if you don't inspire people, or if you, for example, if you don't bring in interdisciplinary people to bring in from different backgrounds, from different disciplines, you know, to 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 to, to give you the feedback uh, and to, to 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 generate ideas, you know, that was never stressed upon. Uh, but now, since we, as we talked early on, we're focusing on the process, focusing on the principles. So empathy, uh, generation of ideas, uh, and then uh, once you have the ideas, you go prototype them, you test them, and, and so on. And I think that's that's really that's that's really what powers this this approach. Again, I don't want to use the word methodology. Some people do, some books do. I never liked it, but uh, I think that that's that's what it is. I love that. I love that you don't like it, but I I continue to to like it because <laughs> I do see I do see it as a methodology. But but it's interesting that you don't, and and that's the power of of us looking right. at it from a completely different perspective. So when you mention when you mentioned you know about how to empathize with customers, I want to also underline that customer doesn't mean someone who pays you you have internal customers in your organization Absolutely. so if you are if you are a support uh, uh, staff or an employee your customer is the other employee mm -hmm. right so you need to take that the term or the proverb uh, put your you know uh, walk walk a mile in their shoes you need to take it at a, a at a real level like you really need to go and walk a mile in their shoes and see how do how are they uh, experiencing this program that you put together how are they experiences this accounting system that you decided right so those are harder for you to point because you don't see them as your customers but they are exactly because you're serving them right because they're internal and then when you talk about the process of coming up with ideas that's something that is very very researched 
but then it's not highly implemented in organization, right? How do you come up with ideas? Most likely, it's not at work when you come up with ideas. Most likely, right? right. Uh, they, they, we, we joke about the three Bs, right? Of these are the places where ideas come. The three Bs are the bed, the bath, and the bus. <laughs> and, and, and the bed is because that's when you dream of the ideas because you've thought about it all day long and you let it you know, sit in your head. And then when you go sleep and suddenly you wake up or just be some people just before going to sleep, they come up with an idea. And this is how we say, you know, if you know the process of, of coming up with ideas, you want to make sure that you have a notebook next to your bed right. so you, that you immediately write down the ideas. And then in the bath, I mean, the best ideas come <laughs> in the shower, don't they? Sure. And that's why they designed and they created a waterproof paper that you can just stick it in the bathroom and a pencil will work underwater, exactly. right? Yeah. So just simply write ideas while they are coming. Do not wait for them to come later because then when we say, you know, we joke, we say the muse will not come you when you exactly. want it. And the third thing, if you're in a bus, because in a bus, your mind is not thinking directly about the idea or the, about the problem that you're trying to solve. It's just wandering around. It could be a bus. It could be um, you driving. Know, you could alone. Be driving. It could be exactly. But we hopefully not driving because you want to focus on driving. Yeah, right? yeah. It's, it's when you're not focused, right? If you are cleaning something or if you are doing something so repetitive that doesn't require your mind, that's when your ideas start to connect the dots because this is where your uh, subconscious brain is coming to, to, you know, in right. action mode. And so understanding the process of problem solving and then understanding your process exactly. because everyone will come up with ideas in a different way. So what do you need to do to amplify the creative part that you already have because we are all born creative? Exactly, exactly. And I think this is this is so true. And I think if we delve down into this process of idea generation, because uh, you you, may, you touched on two things, and I want to. Uh, one was the you mentioned that uh, uh, you know we there are a lot of use cases. It's not just basically a customer who pays us, but there could be internal customers. So I'll come to that in a second. But this, the second part that you mentioned was the idea generation, and that's why you know in the in the idea generation part of design thinking or other methodologies, which I would like to talk about, there are other methodologies or approaches similar to mm -hmm. design thinking. Uh, it, when, when, you know, first they encourage divergent thinking, right? So come up with yeah. ideas, you know, from whatever. So they can be silly ideas. They can be ideas that, as you said, they could be, you, you can come to you while you're you know, going to bed or while you're in a bus or, or whatever. So, uh, so the idea is to generate as many ideas as possible. You know, it, it reminds me of a, a very famous quote from um, from a, uh, I believe he's a, a Nobel laureate, uh, Linus Pauling, who said, uh, you know, when he was asked that, you know, because he had won two Nobel Prizes. So they asked him about that, you know, he came up with two great ideas, you know, you got Nobel Prizes for those. And he said, well, to get great ideas, you need to first come up with lots of ideas, you know, and yeah. from lots of ideas, then you can come up with the right one or two ideas, which will work, which will really transform your organization or your give you a good product and so on. So, so, so the divergent thinking uh, or the process of where you can get as many ideas as possible by employing divergent thinking from all sources, all you know, people from all disciplines, teams of all disciplines is very important. And then once you have the ideas, then you go into the second phase, which is the convergent thinking where you, know, you start making choices that you know, what, what, needs, what needs to be focused on, right? So, so, so that is absolutely very critical. So, uh, but but I want to go back to the first point that where you mentioned that you know you, you could have uh, that you could so, you could use design thinking, and this is something very important I think for all of us to understand. It's not it's not just about creating products like Apple coming up with the iPod or iPad, and, you know the Mac and and so on, but it's about um, uh, solving problems in accounting, as you mentioned, or solving problem in the marketing department, uh, or solving problem in you know your sales are going down. So what can we do? Uh, and, and I think this is this is what it gives it power, and that's the reason I was you know we we all know now because it has been quite advertised quite a bit in the in the press that IBM has gone out for the past few years now, and they have hired so many design thinkers 
in all levels of the organizations. And they're really using design thinking as the base for uh, solving all their problems. So it could be creating new products. It could be re-engineering their processes. It could be solving a problem, specific problem uh, in the you know, sales uh, marketing department and in, in, in the HR department and so on. And a lot of companies are doing this now. So, uh, so this, th I think this is where we see uh, that the, the, the value of design thinking is not just uh, uh, you know, focus on one specific aspect, but you know, it could be applied in multiple places. Absolutely. And, and you nailed it down to the basics, diversion and conversion. This is how you problem solve. You come up with an idea and then you decide if it fits or not. Mm -hmm. What we're going with, in, if you want to become a little bit more creative or a little bit more innovative in your approach, is that you extend this. So you do a lot of ideas before you go thoroughly, thoroughly a process of, of making a decision and even a group decision on which one works best. So this is a basis of all processes, right? Mm -hmm. And the difference is when you have a methodology, again, I'm using this, yeah. if you have a you will have it repeated in more than one phase. So when we are cr trying to um, to do the, the prototype, for example, so you came up with ideas and you're trying to see which one works, you are going to create a number of prototypes, not just one. And then you will decide which one to go for, uh, forward with. And if you're doing research, you, you're a very basic level, right? Uh, the very first step, and you're, you're going out and speaking with, sorry, with people. And so you want to speak with a lot of people using so many different ways to bring in the information. This is where gathering, this is where the uh, diversion comes in before you decide on, okay, which ones are the ones that are most related and most important. And you don't get stuck into just gathering information, thinking that you've done right. something you know, creative or different. It's, it's a whole idea of choosing, exactly. right? The, it's, it's the same thing, but... The emphasis, yes, when you mention the number of ideas, I mean, Edison had to go through, what, 10,000 light bulbs that didn't work before one worked? Exactly. And all the different, all the different creative, if you want to call them geniuses, they're never solo, but they all go through a lot of ideas before they find the good one. And research, research proves that your best ideas are the last third Exactly. of the total of your ideas so if you just have three ideas basically have none right but if you come up with 30 ideas you might have five right and i know i'm not calculating it's right and that's right, with right. intention right. because if your brain we're like your brain is is made to be lazy right mm -hmm. least to become most efficient it gives you the most recent ideas and the most used so this is why when you have a group ideation uh, uh, a session and you only ask them to come up with 10 ideas, most likely seven of those ideas, even without them speaking with each other, seven of those ideas for this one challenge will be very similar. Exactly. Right? They all think alike because that's what they've been going through in the past 24 hours or so. So your brain just gets rid of the most recent ideas and say, okay, here are some suggestions. Right. And the problem happens when people accept the first idea that works for their problem. They don't go after the best idea. And there is a difference. And this yeah. is because here is where you have a time and space for ideas. Yeah. So the first part of your, your like the first idea is that first your brain will just give you the one that are regular. And then you will say, okay, I need 10 more. And so your brain will like, okay, yeah. let's dig into uh, previous history, uh, problems that we solved in, in different places or problems that I've seen or ideas I've seen elsewhere. And this is where metaphorical thinking right. works. And I've seen in this industry or I heard my neighbors talk about this. Or so. so it starts to branch out. And then if you are talking and sharing about these ideas with others, then you start to connect ideas together, unrelated ideas. And then you become a little bit more creative. Exactly. But, but then you don't stop there. You want to push them a little bit harder just before exhaustion. And you want to push a little bit harder and say, okay, what else? And the word, what else is a magical word? What else? What else? And then you start, okay, those new ideas, can we connect them with other ideas? Can we come up with a new way of thinking? 
Right. You know, they say in, in the creativity research, they say it's way more easier to tame a wild tiger than to bring the wild in a pussycat. Mm -hmm. Correct. And that works with ideas. If you come up with a really creative, insane, like insane and, and, and very out there uh, tiger idea, you're able to, to hone it down to fit what you need to do. But if you come with a regular idea that just, you know, everyone else had it, but you just do it a little bit faster or a little bit bigger or a little bit, you know, uh, different color, then it's not really that creative. And you're just like fooling yourself, just getting right. things done right. because you are, you know, packing people's uh, schedule with we don't have time sure. for ideas. Well, I think the, the, this is so interesting what you talk about. And I think... You know, I was thinking as you were talking, and it is so true that you, as it, I think the point that you made that the good ideas sometimes take time to come in. You know, I, you know, we have been working in the or, in organizations where for the past few years the push has been on the magic term has been agility, and a lot of organizations yeah. simply take agility. They only take you know agility has different dimensions. One of them is speed. So, and usually organizations only take the speed part. So. I mean, and I've seen this, you know, when I, for example, when I would ask someone, what do you think agile means? They'll say fast, but, you know, agility means a lot, lot more things. But in any case, the reason I'm mentioning this is that when they're talking about implementing agility, they're talking about doing things fast in organizations, usually, which is a mistake. It's not just about being fast. It's also being responsive to the customer and, you know, going through all the right motions and coming up, you know, of course, doing it fast. But the reason I'm mentioning this in this context is, that sometimes the I feel that you know uh, a lot of organizations are becoming trying to speed up everything. They're trying to speed up even the innovation process, and in that process, they are leaving out the good ideas because they're they're picking up the low hanging fruit, the obvious ideas which are there, which everyone knows about. They'll pick them, those up and they'll go forward with them and they'll try to implement them in a fast way. But they may not be you know they may be implementing something fast which is not right. You, you see what I'm saying? They need to, it's better to slow down sometimes to get the right ideas and at least come up with something which would meet the customer and solve their problems as opposed to, you know, pick the wrong idea and exactly. go through it in a fast way. So it's, 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 and that's why it's tricky. And hopefully we'll talk about this in, in, in the, some of the challenges that people, organizations are having in implementing design thinking. But I feel that one of the problems, uh, challenges that, that they're there is that, you know, they're, Picking up on all these methodologies, approaches, they're trying to mix them up. And sometimes yeah. if they don't understand the right principles, as you mentioned in the beginning, then they'll end up with something which may not be what they're looking for. And that's why then they fail. And then there's disappointment and, and, and so on. So, uh, so since we have limited time, uh, Rhonda, I would like to, uh, one of the things that I would like to uh, uh, ask you, and I know you have had some experiences that, you know, we talked about the principles of design thinking and all the good things, the empathy, the empathy part, the coming up with the, defining the problem part, creating lots of good ideas. You know, if we look at some of the other uh, approaches slash methodologies, such as uh, creative problem solving, uh, and, uh, you know, there are design sprints, there is lean startup. I, they, they seem to be like all offshoots of this. And I think you mentioned that you have worked with biomimically uh, as well. So, uh, you know, maybe you can shed some uh, insight into this, but it seems like that all of them build on some of the same insights. I personally feel that design thinking is maybe a superset of a lot of these things. But, you know, I just would like to hear from you as to what do, what do you think about you know, the principles being applied into some other approaches and, and methodologies. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the idea of them is that you don't know everything and that's okay. And then you need to, you can just pick a process and, and trust it that it will get you to where you need to go. But then any other process will also get you to another place. So it's not about mixing them. You said mm -hmm. it, right? It's not about mixing them. Although sometimes you can take some of the tools from each one of them and this makes your your process even more richer so um uh, if if i can continue with the with the idea of okay this is approach this is a design thinking approach and it helps you connect more with the people that you are trying to help but then i found like i i, I worked with that and i worked like you mentioned in other, with other processes i found that it you don't need to apply it everywhere and sometimes it doesn't work everywhere and i'll give you an example 
So in, in a, a project that I worked with where they brought in designers and artists from all different disciplines to work on a specific project, they were trying to blend in two different industries mm -hmm. to come up with one solution that fits both. So it was arts and, and hospitals, and they were trying to find arts that heals, right? Mm -hmm. And so there were a lot of designers in the house. And... Uh, I, because of the time limit and talking about speed, speed doesn't mean that you take a lot of time to come up with ideas. It just means slowing down when needed and speeding up when you just need to implement. So we had very limited diet time. We had two days to come up with ideas and create a full strategy plan on how to implement this idea. That it was a huge uh, uh, like implementation in the yeah. cities. So it wasn't something small. But then I didn't take design thinking because I had the designers who had their own processes and they already, they, it's already in their mindset. They know how to connect with people in different ways. So rather than force them to fit into this big box, I chose a different process. And this is where creative problem solving helped me because it is based more on cognitive uh, iterative steps rather than empathy and feeling. And I wanted them to put their heads because they speak in so many different empathetic languages that I wanted them to figure out how to go, how to make it super strict and super focused. And that worked beautifully well, right? Because it was the right process for that project. Sure. Meanwhile, if you find another, another, like when I find another organization or another team that said, uh, we have a very a complicated problem and, and that fits perfectly for design thinking because they solve the, what we call wicked problems, right? Mm -hmm. Wicked problem is uh, when you have a problem that has uh, a lot of, of, of social and cultural implications and so many opinions that you don't know where to start with mm -hmm. and where does it end and you have so many different information and, and a lot of it is, is unclear or untrue so you have something that is like a, a very a big hairy messy ball so design thinking works best but also biomimicry works best so there's no you know there's no best I'm just like canceling them both but biomimicry basically says whatever you need to solve nature has solved it in a different way. So what you need to figure out is what is the function? What is the thing that you want to say? Do you want to restore something? Do you want to move something? Is it is it readapting or connecting or collaborating? Whatever it is. So you find the function that you want to solve and then you find the strategies and the analogies that nature has already solved, whether it's in rainforest, is in the reef, is in, in the middle of the sea, is in the middle of the desert, whatever it is, they have solved the product and service and, and community designs in a way that we didn't even have the 3.8 million years of experience to do so. Well, this is great. Yes, and so taking that and 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 stripping it out to the abstract and say, okay, how can I apply it to business? This kind of metaphorical thinking takes you to a, a very different level of, of creativity sure. because you're connecting things that seems unconnected, right. but then you're doing it in a way that fits your problem at hand and it solves it. So oh. Again, it, it, there is value in an organization implementing one method because everyone is using the same vocabulary and then you don't need to train and retrain train people. And so they can go deep and strong and, and, and very powerful in that. But there is also value in using more than one method because you could take you know, some tools from here and apply it there. And you can say, oh, I read about this idea here. And then here is where metaphorical thinking, which is also an important um, principle in design thinking, metaphorical thinking. But if you do it using different approaches, then it only enhances your own, uh, then it becomes your own method, right? Then you, you will have your own way. And you can say, I use parts of here and here and here. But like you said, like you mentioned, not using it without knowing what you're doing. You need to invest in, in, in getting like in a whole immersive experience and getting involved in the methods and then picking the parts that fits you. Exactly. You know, like when, you, when, when they tell you, you need to know all the rules before you break them. That's exactly it. No, this so is not true. Yeah. 
you need to know the methods mm -hmm. and then you decide, do you want to stick with one, which is totally fine, or do you want to create your own, which is also fine? No, this is, this is so, I think what you just mentioned at the end is so true. Actually, if you, I've seen some organizations where, you know, you go in and talk to them and say, what kind of design thinking approach are you using? If they tell you verbatim, you know, from the book that this is what we're using, you can tell that they, they are the early steps of implementing this process because every organization is different, right? Uh, you know, once you, as you said, once you understand the principles, then people will find a way saying, well, you know what, in my organization, I need to focus more on this part and not maybe on this part. Exactly. So maybe I can take something from creative problem solving, uh, or maybe I can take something from a lean startup methodology, or maybe I can, like Google, for example, that is, is quite well documented that some of their big projects came in when they um, use this uh, methodology called the design sprints, which is a some similar to design thinking, but it's a time box methodology where in five days people get in, they try to solve a problem, they try to come up with as many ideas as possible, and uh, you know it, it may not give them enough time to maybe prototype and test, but you know it, it serves the purpose. So and again, it depends on the problem that you're trying to solve, and I think this is this is just so important, as you said, that we have to look at the it's 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 about as you said. Um, take the methodology or approach, but really understand the principles of why you're doing them and, you know, and, and using the right principles and then applying them to your, to your situation. Uh, one thing I want to mention is in this case is that uh, it reminds me that, uh, for example, you know, uh, you know, in, in, in typical project management, you know, people have asked me that can we use design thinking, for example, you know, to replace project management. And I've told them that, look, you know, I've managed projects all my life. And usually for project managers, typically, uh, the starting point is usually if you ask them, you know, what, what, what do you need to manage a good project? And they'll say, well, I want a defined scope, right? I want a good scope. And then once I have a good scope, I can, you know, take it through the motions and implement and deliver the project. But design thinking is about making sure that you have the right scope in the first place. Because, you know, how many times, I mean, at least I have in my, in my throughout my career, I've worked and seen many projects where management has defined the scope, the, the project managers have delivered the scope, only to find out that well we worked on the wrong problem. Maybe it was yeah. not. Maybe it was not something that we really needed. Yeah, we did a good job in delivering it. You know, we did everything right. But you know, maybe this was not what the customer wanted. It's yeah. because the steps before defining the scope, that we're defining the problem, we're understanding what the customer, we're coming up with ideas. That traditionally, you know, historically, organizations have not sp spent time on this. You know, yes. maybe someone would dream up with an idea in a strategy session saying, I want, how about we deliver this? A couple of people will say, they'll look at it and they say, okay, great idea to start it. So they'll define the scope. They'll spend maybe a million dollars on it to implement it. But, you know, no one spent the time and the effort to, you know, to define that scope. And that's why I think it, it, it really emphasizes the point that, you know, why it's so difficult sometimes for people to, uh, for organizations that if they don't do this properly, they could, you know, be in, you know, for, for some bad news. Exactly. And, and just to add an example to what you just described. So in design thinking, uh, the pre-step to, mm -hmm. to, to the scope is the empathy part. It's going out and seeing where the problem happened and how do people deal with that problem, right? Yeah. And in creative problem solving, the pre-step is gathering idea and formulating challenge statements. So the questions that you want to decide which one will take you in what direction before you make a decision sure. on what that scope means. So there is always a step before in any of those of those methods uh, that helps you better understand, you know, what your problem is, what you have to clarify it first sure. before you decide. And this is where they skip the, uh, the generation, the, the idea generation part, because ideas isn't always about solving a problem. It's also about finding what the problem is exactly so you they skip the whole thing of coming up with all the different uh, problems that are there to decide on before you make a decision on what's your scope yeah understanding right? the root causes of the problem exactly before we do this so um so run i think that maybe this is a good segue into uh you know so we've talked about all these nice principles that that organizations can use to implement design thinking now let's talk about some of the tools that we can uh, use and throughout these different steps. So, you know, we, we talked about uh, talked about the empathy part. We talked about the idea generation part. 
we talk about then the uh, um, prototyping and testing. Uh, so yeah. are there any tools? Let, let's talk about some of the tools. Uh, let's talk about the empathizing part. Uh, any okay. tools that you could recommend or have you used that you know bring out the value of, of, of this uh, process? Yeah, of course. So when empathy, we say we want to know, we want to walk in someone's shoes. So mm-hmm. what would the first step be if you wanted to find out what someone experiences? What would you do first thing? Well, I want, I want to know what, 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 what are they thinking? What are they saying about it? What are they talking How about? How would you do it? How would you do it? Well, one of the tools that we have used it is using the empathy map, right? So you know, what, what do the users say about the oh. thing? What do they talk about? What do they feel about it? Exactly. But like, if you forget about a, a tool, I want to bring it to basics because talk, talk the more basic talk it is, them. exactly. Talk talk so them. you will talk with people and ask them questions rather than impose your own understanding. So sure. you would go with a very, uh, we call it child's mind. Like, I don't know, tell me everything. You would also go and if you are not able to talk with them, you can also go and sit where they sit. Right. So being present in the place where you are trying to understand what is the problem and where or how do people behave around the problem? It could be a service that you're offering and you want to see people how they experience it. Or it could be a space you want to design and you want to see how people are interacting with the different things that are there. So being there, it helps. Speaking with them helps creating a mood board of all the different touch points, everything that they have to go through when they are dealing with the thing that you are trying to think about helps, right? Just putting pictures, asking people to show you, you know, if if it's something that you are creating for an everyday use, asking people to show you what's in their bags every day, right? So that you can see, does it fit or doesn't, right? Asking people to, um, and of course, there is a difference between when you ask them to tell you, they could tell you certain things, and between when you're watching them, and observing them, of course, with permission, right. and, and, and just following them. Because sometimes people do things without noticing. And it only takes an insight, say, why did you do that? And mm. you're like, oh, I, I don't know. I just, I'm used to doing that, right? Exactly. So it, if you keep it basic and very, very simple, you're able to do more of it. And it becomes part of your process. I would rather to do that than implement something like a a whole process of empathy at the very beginning, right? You can also develop it later, but start very, very basic and speak, like they say, eyeball to eyeball, right? And and like be there when you need to be there. So this is when you're talking about empathy. And then when you take it to, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say that I think in this context, there is something that they, uh, uh, there's also this thing called ethnography, right? Ethnography, yes. they say that you also observe people. So, for example, you know, you just want to, you know, go out in spaces, for example, in the markets or, you know, depending again on your product, where you can simply sit and watch people. Or maybe sometimes you watch them under video and see exactly how do they react, how do they use the product, you know, how do they feel, you know, and look at those interactions and their experiences from a different angle. And you bring those yes. to the table as well. So, so, exactly. so you're correct, yeah. But again, you know, I think the key point is that, that you know, as you go through this process, as, as you mentioned, talking to them, understanding them, or you observe them and so on, this takes time, right? And this is the part, again, I would like to emphasize from, and again, from coming from an organization standpoint, that organizations who are trying to implement these things in their midst, they need to yes. be patient, they need to understand the value of these things, as opposed to thinking that it's a waste of time. It's not a waste of time. You're trying to understand yes. about the customer. You're trying to understand, learn more about them and so on. Exactly. I, I jokingly say you need to see people in their natural habitat, right? right Where right. do they actually, how do they actually interact? Yes, it does take time. And the value of it is that you are solving the right problem exactly. by doing this process, right. right? You are not skipping things because you really need to go to the root of the problem. You don't want to design something that they're not going to use. Right. If you see them, you will see that they use something else that doesn't work well for them. And you just fix that. Right. rather than impose something new on them. So this is a very, very important step. And second, if you really stretch on time, there is always ways to do things differently. So rather than sit in an office to work on your scoping, go and sit where the problem is happening and still work on your scoping. And But then being in the right environment will give you ideas on how to change the way that you do. 
there is value in the knowing the space effect on your own creativity. So right. there is research even that proves that the ceiling height, the ceiling height in the room that you are sitting in will help you either come up with really big, vast, visionary ideas or very detailed and focused, right? Depending mm -hmm. on how high and how low is the ceil ceiling. So if you're sitting in front of a window, this is an open door for ideas in front of the ocean, the sky, everything that is very big. This is where your idea generation happens best. And if you want to start to implement things and you're already going through the details and you need to create the program, the planning and all that, go into a place where everyone else is working and somehow it is a little bit more closed environment, right? right. Not so closed, but then even the ceiling being lower, it doesn't have to be the ceiling itself. It could be just the lamp that coming down from the ceiling, it's a bit lower so that it gives you an intense feeling of I need to focus, right? So this whole thing tells you that you don't need to uh, take more time than you need if you really don't have time. But then when you do have time, you need to put that, right? right? And, and again, going back to the idea of finding the right tool, you need to find the right tool, right? It's not the same tool for everyone. Brainstorming doesn't work everywhere. Exactly. So stop using it everywhere, right? And coming, you know, to a meeting and, and putting two-hour meeting for brainstorming doesn't really work. So stop doing that. You'd rather ask people to come up with ideas on their own first, on their own. And then they come to that meeting, half an hour only. And each person, even if they are just three people, if each person comes up with 10 ideas on their own, they already went through the phase of getting rid of their common ideas. And then together for the next 10 minutes, they're already working with 30 ideas. They can, you know, <clears throat> mix and match each. And then they, they start to ideate more on that. So it's about, uh, you know, uh, brainstorming um, may not work by itself, but brain dump where a person comes up with an ideas on their own. And plus, going through the brainstorming process where you bounce your ideas off of other people, I come up with an idea, you can tell me whether my idea is good or bad, or you can change yes. it based on what you came up with and so exactly. forth. Exactly. So you, you start with ideas. You don't start with zero. You start with ideas and you come to the meeting and then you talk. And then here is an important part because idea, like people don't come up with ideas the same way. You have people who are very extrovert and they love to jump off ideas and then you have people who need to think about their ideas and right. talking about it like you know throwing off ideas really slows them down mm -hmm. so i would always mix things up i would use a tool for example a tool called brain writing mm -hmm. right it's it's a no speaking tool so you basically you create it could it could happen on just like random pieces of, of paper or you could create a, a sheet where you have different boxes or post it yeah. or whatever. And you ask people to write ideas silently sure. and then you switch those ideas, you switch those paper around and then people get to read other people's ideas and then either add to them or, or change them or write something completely different or just be inspired and then continue to shuffle those papers mm -hmm. again silently but to give the time, to give the, 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 uh, the ability for people who don't like to throw off ideas, you know, just speaking about it, to give them the chance to come up with their best ideas. Right. And so... And of course, to silence those who uh, will not stop talking. Absolutely, right? I think this is no. This is so true. You know, initially when I got into this idea generation thing, I thought it was, you know, just you, you walk into a room. But I think once you once you and, and come up with ideas, but once you educate people on how idea generation works, and yes. it's the it's not just the conscious part of the brain; it's also the subconscious and the unconscious part of the brain that works to come up, come up with ideas. It's not all always the logical part. It's sometimes yeah. also the imaginative part, you know, yeah. and when you start realizing that the conscious and the up, unconscious and the subconscious and the, and the, you know, the logical and the imaginative, they all come together and you, and you cannot trigger all of them at the same time, as you said, it could be different for different people in different instances. That's why spaces, as you mentioned, yeah. are so important. And it's, it's a huge topic. It's quite fascinating. You know I mean? Uh, you know, just how you, how you involve people to come up with the right ideas so, um, so go ahead. I just want one one point to mention, like 
because diversity of, of like uh, when we're talking about design sprint, you are bringing people from different function. And this is like basic for Absolutely. creativity. You want Absolutely. people coming from, you want to break those silos. You might as well break the way of coming up with ideas because people think differently. So you want to use different tools to be sure that you are bringing the best out of everyone. And those could right. include uh, t- uh, tools that people are, you know, jumping off ideas or tools that people are taking time to develop. Sure. Right. So, Absolutely. so a mix of that is very important. No, I think this is uh, this. You know, we can segue into the next or the last part of the conversation. Is uh, you mentioned silos, and that was right on my mind when you mentioned it. Is that you know how you know, what challenges do organizations usually have in implementing design thinking? And I can tell you one thing for sure is that you know an organization that works in silo mode and if they're trying to you know do design thinking and, and stay in silo mode it doesn't really work so let's let's start with, the, with that so uh, i mean, i think that maybe that's that's the first point that you know you can't you know for organizations to come in and again that's why i was against the word methodology even though i understand the reasons for it is that when they bring it in and say let's start using it as step by step in our silo organization well it's not going to work right that's why it's important to, to go down to the principles of why and change, have a ch- change in mindset, change in culture, uh, you know, focus on those parts as opposed to implementing a methodology. So what else, what other challenges uh, um, have you witnessed, have you faced uh, to, uh, in organizations to, you know, to bring design thinking within the organization? Yes. Okay. Th- that's a beautiful question. I'll, I'll just take you through a, a very brief history of how did I arrive to this culture? So it started with me helping organization come with better service and better mm. products, right? So we started there. And then when we would go and say, okay, let's create something different, I would notice that people are very stuck with idea generation. Mm. So I, we went from designing products or thinking about products or services to um, training people. So let's train people on different creativity tools. Let's train people on thinking differently and and applying those methods. And then we invested in that. And then suddenly people are very frustrated because they have this superpower thing and then they go back to work and they cannot implement it because the process doesn't work. So yes. You know? And then we went to the process. Okay, what are your processes? These are so bureaucratic. Why do you need to go through all of this just to get an approval? Let's eliminate those. So focusing on the process means restructuring the organization. And that just created a whole chain of changes that people now are unhappy with. And so when you also you look at that and in comparison, you look at the creativity research and you say, OK, the four P's like the product, the people, the 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 uh, the uh, process, the process. Exactly. And then what we call the press, which is the environment that encompasses all that's that's the culture. Mm-hmm. And I, in parallel, I, I looked at, OK, so it's the culture. If you focus on that. And if you try to do, and of course, culture is a is a long term vision. But exactly. if you focus on that and you start shifting things slowly, you plan it slowly. But the insights happen rapidly because as soon as people catch it on, they can change things faster, right? Exactly. So this is why it's not a milestone; it's an insight. And so the challenge is that organizations say, "Okay, come and train us." I don't do training anymore because your whole process doesn't help. It doesn't fit. And when you look at an innovative culture, there are so many different dimensions that help you. And I try to categorize them and say, okay, which part do you want to work on? And I came up with five general categories, right? So one is the people, right? And I'll tell you first the category and then I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about it. One is the people and who are they and how do they work with each other? And that's a whole, that's the main thing, like the mm-hmm. step one, if you want to say. And then you have the processes and the systems and, and how much do you experiment, you know, in, in your organizations or do you experiment? What's the dynamic level in the organization? Are there ev- ha- things happening all the time or is it a, like a stale and, and, and dead environment? So, so that's another category. You have the resources and here is where the idea time comes in. Do you offer the time? Do you offer access to information, to ideas, to time, to to funds, to technology, mm-hmm. so that people can implement those ideas that happen in the 
bed and bath and bus, right? Mm-hmm. If right. you don't if you don't support that, then you you don't right. have that. And then do you have the tools and methodologies, which which is what we talked about? Like, do you use something specific, or is it just you know just you need to get it done by end of today, sure. right? And then you also have the space. How is the space helping people? How is the furniture and, and the writing, uh, you know, surfaces that you are using? Are there any? Uh, they, they talk about the fish tank effect. If you are in a highly uh, stressful environment and people are constantly um, trying to get things done, running, screaming, and all that, having a fish tank <laughs> exactly. Is- soothes them a little bit so they just like take a, a breath or having a, a separate room where someone can just go and close the lights and just like relax for for 20 minutes you need that you you cannot take this away from people because you need to reboot your system every once in a while and that right. system is your brain right uh, so so this is the category in general. What do you think about it? Like no, no, I, you... I, I think two key things that came up came up from this, what you, what you were just talking, and they're so, so important. Number one is, as you mentioned, if, if organizations are thinking that they're going to implement design thinking by training alone, it's not going to work. It doesn't work, right? As you said, you know, I mean, you can train people. Actually, you'll, you, as you, the word that you use, that it increases people's frustrations because you know, they go back to their, Old, cult, old work environments, and they're trying to implement those things, which doesn't support all this, so it doesn't work. So it, it's, it's a disaster, right? So, so this is such a key point. The second point is that all these things that you mentioned, which are important for design thinking to, uh, to work, which is the empathizing part, the time, the space part, especially that you mentioned and so forth, this really means, and this proves the point, that for, for this to work, you need to start at the leadership level, because, you know, it's, it, it's, it, a manager at a lower level won't be able to make all these changes, right? It's not going to happen. So, yes. and this is one of the key reasons where design thinking works and it doesn't work. That in organizations where leadership buys into it, where they understand what needs to be done in terms of culture, in terms of time, giving people the time, in terms of the space and so forth, they understand that, uh, that you know, and so they make the investment. They'll make the investment in me and they'll understand that it's not about, you know, using one methodology for one project and, and getting the results. It's about a yeah. journey, as you, I think you mentioned it. It's a journey uh, that, that, that can take some time. You know, it will pay dividends at the end, uh, but at the end, it reduces the risk for them. You know, if you ask the CEO, some of the, the senior executives that I've spoken to, the, 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 the real value is that as you go through the process, it reduces the risk. You know, they want, they, they, they get the, com- they, the confidence goes up in terms of the products that they're delivering, the services that they're delivering, and, and so on, and all the problems that they're solving, as opposed to, you know, every time, you know, usually I've seen this all my life, that an executive invests the money, you know, with a lot of confidence thinking that, you know, this is going to solve my, you know, certain problem. And they yeah. deliver that project and the problem is not solved. And, you know, it, it just is a, such a big disappointment. So design yeah. thinking, by the token of changing the culture, changing, bringing the changes that you mentioned, I think reduces the risk and gives them the confidence that things, you know, can actually work. Exactly. The whole, the, the, you know, when you're talking about people, that's that's the thing. The, you start by noticing, do the people trust each other? And you talked about self-confidence or confidence in general about what you're doing, but also self-confidence. Like if your organization in like it builds confidence with with people and say okay we trust you even if you do a mistake it's totally fine we are learning from it actually we invested in you to do this mistake and so now we learned how not to do it again so if you have that if you have the the confidence building if you have the trust between each other if you have uh, support with the feedback with the growth forget about feedback at the end of the year this is nonsense you need feedback daily Exactly. See, right? And so how do you progress? You don't you don't progress once a year. You don't step up a level once a year. You step up every day. And this is where you switch from a, a, a milestone a mindset to an insight mindset because I could come up with something. I could realize something. And then the next morning, I completely change the way that I work because of this insight. And it right. works brilliantly. Right? Yeah, you know, absolutely. So you don't wait until the end of the year to right. do that. So a, 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 a trusting culture or a culture that, you know, you have a healthy dose of, of conflict. Right. Conflict is important, 
you don't want people to agree with each other on everything. It means sure. all your ideas are exactly the same. Exactly. You want people to disagree, like us with methodologies, right? Mm-hmm. right, right. You, you want people to say, I don't see it right. And you want to be able to, oh, you want to see that people from a lower status in terms of jobs, right? Lower status are able to um, have a healthy conversation, even if it's a conflicting conversation with the leadership, sure. saying, we don't think what you're doing works because we are actually working directly with our customers and we see that we, what you're trying to create is not translating right. right. And so if there is no open communication with that, that should tell you that the culture has something uh, that needs to, to work on. And, and so whatever training, whatever certification really doesn't help. You need to work at that level. Sure. And taking just a, another part of it, even if you have a good solid culture and you think it's working really well, you also have those mini cultures right. where teams and departments and organizations behave differently. And I've seen it and, I, and I'm sure you've seen it in organization when you see a team that works so cohesively together, they're collaborative, they depend on each other and that's a big part, right? So they depend that the other person will do what they said they will do Mm-hmm. And another team in the same organization under the same main culture where a lot of envy is happening, a lot of distrust, a lot of backstabbing. Yeah. But then in front of everyone else, I, I, you know, I provided you the work and you just didn't right. finish. Right. Uh, no, Can think, you see that? Right. No, I think you mentioned some some of the points. I mean, I, I was just. As you were talking, I was thinking that you know this this can be a whole different talk, right? Uh, <laughs> one of one of the points I would like to emphasize is that when you mentioned that you know we need feedback daily, right? And this yeah. is this is the key to something that organizations have been struggling with, struggling with, and which is called the learning organization, organization and so on. It came up independent of this term design thinking, but I've been saying this for a while now that design thinking uh, uh, brings about some a culture change which makes the organization, because of its constant feedback and things of that sort, it makes an organization learn rapidly, you know, and get the insights as you you mentioned. And once an organization becomes a learning organization, then that's, you know, when it's on the right track, when it can get the right innovations in place, kind of get the right ideas and so on. And and again, one last point, I think as we, maybe we have a few minutes left to to wrap up this, this call, but one of the things that I would like to mention is that, you know, all these organizations, you know, previously in the past, they have, they have come up with these innovation centers, thinking that innovation is going to come only from one part of the organization, and the rest of the organization doesn't have to be innovative, right? And it has not worked too. And in some cases, it may have worked, and may, it may they may have come up with the right products. I think AT&T comes, you know, comes to mind as a good example where they had this this uh, center of uh, AT&T, AT&T Bell Labs, where they were coming up with the right products, they thought you know all the good products were going to come uh, from just one part of the organization. But later on, you know, they realized that you know it's not going to come. We need innovation in all parts of the organization, right? We need or, we need innovation not just in product creation. We need innovation in fixing our processes. We need innovation in changing the culture. We need innovation and in, you know in the in the lowest levels of, of the organization all the way to the you know, where strategies are, are are being formulated and so on. I, do, I want to point out that a learning organization goes way beyond and way further than uh, design thinking, by the sure. way. And I think it, it, it just helps it. I was, I was saying it just helps. The, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it does. It definitely does. But it, it has a whole uh, a big feel that it's uh, sure, exactly. beautiful to, to in, involve it. And then when you mentioned the innovation center, um, yeah, it, you need to decentralize it. You need to give power to people to, to come up with ideas and, and trust that they, they can, you know, give them a, a chance to test these ideas. I believe Adobe had this idea, uh, uh, I don't remember the name of their box, innovation box or something like that, but basically they would give employees uh, a box of of different uh, items, different tools. Mm. Okay. So, yes. So uh, so, uh, a point to what you're making, a learning organization is a a whole uh, different field that one can delve into and it goes beyond just design thinking. So even if just you take that by itself, it takes you uh, a whole step further in in how to become uh, a more... uh, 
I wouldn't say maybe not innovative culture, but at least a well-connected culture that takes you to becoming innovative. And also when you said uh, about innovation center, uh, they don't work because they're very centralized and it takes the power away from people. And you want to decentralize it. You want to make sure that everyone in any department is able to have the time and have the space to experiment with the ideas that they have because you don't know where the best ideas come from. It could be from the, the person who is opening the door for your customers because they notice something they really needed. And it could be from an executive, executive who is working with different departments so they can see the connection with different things. So it is important to uh, give the, like whether it is an innovation program that you implement or a place that you can say, okay, anyone is able to come here and work on their ideas and just post it for anyone else to see and get feedback. So decentralizing it is uh, way more uh, helpful. And this goes to your culture, right? This goes to understanding how do people work with each other? How do they trust each other? Start with just basic observation. How are they talking with each other? Is it friendly? Is it very... Uh, rigid right is it something that okay they enjoy coming to work or they enjoy being with others so these are small things that are very very big on on impact and very big on in measuring your own culture so starting with this observation and the next thing would say i would i would suggest do small like small tiny bits of experience uh, experiments like Things like uh, let's let's uh, let's have a quick chat every day just to talk about you know um, what's happening in your day. It could be a, just a ten minute thing, right? right? It doesn't take your time. Uh, let's have a stand up meeting if we go back to work and 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 be there rather than sit down and take all the time, but just checking in and make sure that everything we're we're running at the same uh, you know at same level. Let's swap offices. I will work in your department while you work here. I'm still working on what right. I do, but I'm in a different environment and that opens up to different kind of connection. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's why, you know, making all these kinds of changes are not easy, right? And I think maybe one of the ways that organizations do it is that they, um, they have these uh, uh, design thinking evangelists or mentors throughout the organization to, you know, to, who can bring out these different kinds of uh, changes in the organization. Absolutely. Okay, Randall, it was, you know, it was a pleasure talking to you. You know, this, to this topic only on the surface, there is just so much to cover in this topic. Uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll get other opportunities to talk about more about the different dimensions of design thinking and innovation and learning organization and so many other related topics. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a really